Hi everyone, this is Mrs. Tevis Finn, recording from room 114. Welcome to the Progressive Era. You guys should uh, listen to how today's screencast shows us what came from the Industrial Era that we've learned about previously. So this is a, a big unit of cause and effect, the rise of us being industrial and the problems that come along with it. So I do have guided notes that let you fill in as I talk, so you're welcome to use those or take your own. But let's look at some pictures first and see if you can figure out what are some of the problems. All right, so I just, I'll backtrack now. So you guys should definitely pay attention to the children on the machines barefoot. So child labor and even just work, workplace safety, meat, you guys should uh, pay attention to the uh, conditions and what goes in the meat and that people now can actually uh, protest to the government to make changes. And this is a big one. This is women's suffrage, so the right to vote. And so let's fill in the theme. As the U.S. became industrialized, many problems arose in society. So progressivism was a series of responses. It was not a unified movement. So these reformers tried to bring changes in integrity to government. Some even fought for women's rights, and others targeted child labor and even the evils of alcohol. And before I answer the question, who were the progressives as a group of people, just think back. Remember, Gilded Age is another word for this industrial era and it really had burdened us with many problems. And you want to think about the gold that kind of covers up the rotten inside, kind of like an apple core that's rotten. So on the outside it might look shiny, but there is uh, filth and uh, a lot of negative um, consequences that we're going to look at today. And so three essential questions for both our group and class discussions will be what is the role and function of government? So you'll see, um, you know, one approach is to actually reform government before we can even help fix problems in society. Uh, two is how are the interests of business, labor, and consumers best balanced? So you guys should look back to the industrial era and remember how there was no regulation on business and labor. And then the last one, uh, a big thinking question for this whole uh, unit is the legacy. So the progressive era has a long-lasting legacy in today's America, so I want you to pay attention to, you know, how do we know that the progressive era actually helped us? You know, what came from this time period that we still have today? So let's look at who were the progressives. And I just have a picture here, and then I'll bring you back to some bullets, and uh, please follow along with your guided notes. So, you know, look at this political cartoon. Um, of someone with a flashlight and a, and a muck rake scraping up some uh, bugs and rats and think about how journalism can change America, right? Uncovering corruption. So let's go back to um, who, the, who this group was. So one group were muck rakers, but let's fill out um, a little bit more about them. So they came from cities. Um, and you guys can also put down that they were educated, middle class. Uh, I put down both political parties, so it's pretty uniform. Their leaders were journalists, social workers, educators, politicians, and clergy. And they all agreed that the government needed to uh, address society's evils. So they all agreed that, but they doubted the current government's ability. So their goal was to reform government and fix it. So they believed in science and power of technology, which had produced inventions like the telephone and light bulb, and thus could also be harnessed to help society. So the five main qualities I have here for you guys, they were moralists, I mean they were trying to, um, you know, make people's values uh, pure. They believed in government, right, once purified could act. They believed in protecting the weak. So that's a little bit of social Darwinism there. They never challenged capitalism. So guys, they were not socialists or anarchists or Marxists. And five, they were paternalistic. And that's a good term for you to review. Uh, it means fatherly. 
so they acted kind of protective and fatherly to the weak. They were also moderate, right? So I'm not, remember, I, I reviewed for um, number four that they weren't radical. So for them to make a big change in society, they need to be moderate. And as you follow along, I gave you this one group. I showed you the picture, and I want you to know that they're called the muck rakers, and they are a righteous and forthright group. They uncovered problems and exposed them in their newspapers and magazines. So Teddy Roosevelt nicknamed them after a character from a book. This character was focused with his head down, um, scraping up dirt, and so this symbolized his salvation in the novel, and then it kind of showed how obsessed these journalists were in always looking for problems. And so to, before I give you the six main muckrakers, uh, Roosevelt, we'll look at his presidency, um, he thought they were obsessed um, with scandals and corruption. You guys can fill in. Um, so, you know, their focus on corporate greed, political corruption, and poverty. They, um, they thought there was a real need for change, um, and their articles sparked that need. So our first muckraker is Charles Edward Russell. You guys can put down that he went after the meat industry in everybody's magazine. Uh, in McClure's, another magazine, Ida Tarbell exposed the Standard Oil Company and their corruption and monopoly. Third is Upton Sinclair. Um, he wrote The Jungle, and he exposed uh, the sausage industry. So we're going to actually read an excerpt from The Jungle. Get ready. Four is Lincoln Stevens. Um, he targeted political corruption, such as vote stealing. His book was called The Shame of the Cities. Uh, Jacob Rees, number five, wrote How the Other Half Lives, and he revealed the uh, deplorable conditions of the immigrant neighborhoods in New York City. So the immigrant poor, such as the tenements. And last, uh, John Spargo, I didn't give you guys room, but you can write his name down. So he revealed the horrors of child labor. So, John Spargo, The Bitter Cry of the Children, is his book. To conclude, all were uh, catalysts, or all sparked a need for change. So, on to the back page. Um, here's just some pictures to go along with the muckrakers. Um, you can see how big uh, Rockefeller is pictured here on the left. Ida exposed him. And then these are boys known as Breaker Boys, uh, so you'll learn about their life in the coal mines. Some of them were as young as eight years old. Let me see if I can move my slide over. There we go. So the main categories of reform, you guys could put down political and government, moral and social, such as uh, temperance, right? Temperance is uh, banning alcohol, business and economic, an example there for um, business and economic would be uh, regulating monopolies. And women's suffrage, that last one, is the right to vote. So you guys need to know what they have in common. All movements began on the state level, and then they went national. So they started small and then spread like wildfire. And so I'm going to finish up today's screencast with just the first area of reform, which was government. So here's the book, The Principles of Scientific Management. The author, please fill in, is Frederick W. Taylor. And he used theories of business efficiency and applied it to government. He observed how companies could break down tasks into smaller parts. Standardized tools could provide job opportunities to unskilled workers. He made note of that, and he applied it to managing a city. So managing a city called for a scientific method to optimize productivity, and he saw a real ineffective city government system where the mayor chose the head of city departments, giving jobs to friends um, who were not qualified. So on this slide are the two proposals that address the need for reform. They are the commission plan and the council manager system. 
So you guys should fill in a commission plan um, divided the government into several departments, each under an expert commissioner's control. And then the council manager system, the city council hired a city manager, not the mayor, to run the city. So there'd be no favorites. And to illustrate the need for reform and how Taylor's ideas were put into practice, I have this awful picture, tragedy strikes and business steps in. So an example here came from a tragedy in Galveston, Texas. There was a devastating hurricane and 6,000 people were killed. And so businesses stepped in when the city failed to help its people. And so guys, fill in there was rapid recovery. People had lost their homes and because the government failed them, businesses helped to rebuild the community. You know, it was in their best interest and they were much more organized than the government. And so other cities saw how it was efficient to divide up governments into departments and let experts take over. So Galveston, you guys can fill in, became a model to follow during the progressive era. And so uh, this is the picture of the devastation as well. I'm going to sign off uh, right about now and hope you guys have um, a great rest of your day. And we'll discuss um, the muckraking and the progressive era tomorrow in class. This is Mrs. Tevis Finn signing off.